and just let everybody join. Welcome to those just uh, logging on. We've got uh, the numbers going up all the time, so we'll give it a few minutes uh, before we do our official welcome and get kicked off this afternoon. It's a rainy afternoon in most parts of the country, so probably quite a good uh, opportunity this afternoon just to get yourself a nice cup of tea with your lunch and uh, sit down and uh, listen to uh, one of these webinars this afternoon. And then we've got some further ones later on as well. Okay, by my clock, it's one o'clock, so we'll make a start, but um, obviously some people will probably join us in the next few minutes and that's absolutely fine. Um, so I'd like to welcome you all again then um, to this afternoon's webinar um, on new colostrum. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, hopefully you're gonna find this afternoon's session um, of interest and enjoyable. Um, my name's Katie James, I'm a communications officer here at NSA. Um, which is a very varied role um, and one of the new parts of that is sometimes hosting uh, sessions like this so hopefully I can uh, manage it okay and pass over to our speaker um, in just a moment. Um, so we're very pleased to welcome Kat Baxter-Smith um, who is MSD's veterinary advisor who's going to be uh, speaking with us this afternoon and passing on um, some of her uh, knowledge and experience. Um, Kat, obviously, like I said, is um, working for MSD. MSD are our sponsors this afternoon, so we're grateful for them um, for helping us to put these on for you all. Obviously, the webinars are open to everybody, not just NSA members. Um, but if you are not yet an MSA, NSA member and you're interested in learning more about our membership, um, we are completely membership funded. We are a charity. Um, and, you know, we try and really sort of get out there and act as the voice of the UK sheep. Um, industry. So um, we've got a lot of work to be coming up. Obviously, it's going to be an increasingly busy time with lots of uncertainties coming our way, but um, hopefully yeah, our membership uh, will be grateful for the work we do um, for them. Um, we will have opportunity for questions and answers um, as we go through. So if you can, please just try and use the Q&A um, button rather than the chat, um, chat button on Zoom. Um, you can use chat for general comments, but the Q&A one, we can just keep a little better track of um, and answer your questions for you. Um, we should last about an hour today. And then following the session this afternoon, um, we will be putting the recording of this webinar on our website. So if there's any further information you want to go back on um, and hear again, read again, then uh, just visit the NSA website. OK, so I'm going to stop sharing that screen and, and pass over to Kat. Um, and I hope you uh, enjoy this afternoon's session. Hi, Katie, and hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me OK. Um, let me just share my screen. Get this up. Here we are. Um, yep, so as Katie said, my name's Kat Baxter-Smith and I'm a veterinary advisor for sheep and beef uh, for MSD Animal Health. Um, I've worked for MSD for about three years. Um, before that, I was a vet in practice in the Midlands um, for seven years. And um, I'm also married to a farmer. So I get, uh, I get to see a lot of the farming from both sides, really. Um, my talk today will be on getting you colostrum right, how to ensure your lambs get the best start. Um, and I've got the hashtag here, colostrum is gold, which some of you might have heard of, especially if you're on the Twitters, um, you can uh, follow that and get some more information there. So what we're gonna look at 
Um, on the agenda today, we have why is colostrum so important? It, it really, really is. So what, what does it do that, that really benefits that lamb in the first few hours and days of life? Um, how we can manage the ewes in pregnancy to ensure that they give the best colostrum they can so that you're getting your money's worth. Um, then moving on to neonatal lamb management. So your ewe is great and perfect. She's producing great colostrum. How can you then ensure that that colostrum gets into the lamb and gives it the benefit that it needs? Um, a little bit on protocols and records, although I'm not one always for numbers and um, things, so that won't be too long. And then summary, and if you have any questions, like Katie said, um, do put them in the q and I'll, I'll try and keep an eye on it as I go along. I can see it on my screen. Um, and if I can answer them as I go along, I will. Otherwise, I'll try and address them at the end. Um, so I'm going to try and make this a bit interactive. And so we have a poll, which Katie's going to run. And um, it really just will help me to understand who's watching and what you do. So um, hopefully the poll will come up on your screen and you can then choose. Um, I can't vote, unfortunately, but you can choose what is your uh, main farm, uh, sort of type of farming enterprise. If you have several, so maybe you have pedigree and a commercial flock, then you can tick both. Um, so yeah, just so I, it gives me an idea of who you are and what you do. And then I can um, try and direct the talk to uh, help you know to see to, to kind of uh, to you guys there might be a massive mixture so if, if that's the case then I can do that too um, don't mind the clock in the background it's, uh, um, that's on my end so yeah what is your type of farming enterprise upland slash hill I know they're not exactly the same but we're keeping them in one group for now uh, commercial pedigree hobby farm or I don't have sheep so we've got the results popped up here. Um, I don't know if you can see them, but I can. So uh, we've got 12% are upland and hill. Great. Uh, quite the majority actually are commercial and pedigree. So we have 46% commercials, 42% pedigree. 19% hobby farm and then 23% I don't have sheep not sure why you're here maybe you're uh, you know wanting to learn more so you can get some sheep hopefully <laughs> um, so great we've got a good mixture here which is actually quite interesting and useful so I'll try and make this talk uh, relevant for all of you so benefits of good colostrum management, um, and this is for everybody, 100%. So gets the lamb, the, when the lamb is born, it's cold, um, particularly if it's outside, it's uh, on the floor, which is cold. So the colostrum has the energy that it needs, the nutrients, gets it warm, gives it that warmth that it needs, gets it up and going. Um, it's got, you know, uh, glucose, vitamins, minerals, nutrients, proteins, everything it needs to, to kind of give it that kickstart um, into life. It will reduce the risk of losses. So um, if they get the right amount of colostrum at the right time, it will reduce the risk of losses due to, and this is just some of the things, there are many more, um, failure of passive transfer, we'll go more into that later, diseases like joint ill, colostral disease like pulpy kidney that they can get in the first few days of life, pastorella, which they can get any time really, uh, watery mouth very common and other infections so you, by getting the colostrum it gives them that kind of um i like to imagine it as being like a ready a ready break glow you know a, a way of preventing um their their susceptibility to infections and actually you know who doesn't want a less stressful lambing period if your lambs are healthy and not dying that is certainly less stress for you okay and we'll go into all of those things in a bit more detail further on in the talk so um, another quick poll, which hopefully Katie can open up for you. Um, when do you think you lose the most lambs? Hopefully you don't lose too many, but uh, you know, it is part of lambing um, and lambs are lost. And uh, we don't really, we want to be trying to minimize that as much as we can. So the options here are um, during pregnancy, either due to barren news, empty use or abortions, um, lambing, so birth to 48 hours of age, uh, 48 hours to pre-weaning, and then post weaning. So when do you think you lose the most lambs? And then Katie will be able to close the poll and hopefully most people have answered. I think we've got about 30 or 40 people here today. So not too um, small a number and hopefully we'll get some interesting results. So that's the poll closed. Um, so what do we have? We've got 17% um, in pregnancy. So Yep, that's, uh, there's actually quite a lot we can do. And I'm not going to talk about this too much today. I, I will touch on it. But if you're losing lambs during pregnancy, um, I think this is something you really need to talk to your vet about and get some testing done. 
um, the most common answer, 71% is at lambing, so birth to 48 hours of age. And actually good colostrum management is one of the key things that can help to prevent these losses. I'm glad this came in, I'm kind of glad this came in first because it makes it really relevant to this talk. So you, if you're in that 71% um, who are losing lambs at lambing, then this talk will hopefully be really helpful for you. And then 13%, 48 hours to pre-weaning. And I, I agree with, I think once you get them past that, that um, first two days, you know, first few days of life, they hopefully then can go on and be, and uh, to, to go on and be healthy and good. Post-weaning, nobody. So uh, at least once they've weaned, then they're, they're going on and doing well. So that's kind of what I would expect, but it's, it's good to see it. So um, here we have some data um, taken from ADAS um, to show when, uh, according to research, the most lamb losses are. So does it correlate with what you guys have said? And actually it does, interestingly enough. So 30% um, uh, abortions and stillbirths, that was a bit more than what we had. Um, tapping to scanning, 33%, but uh, neonatal losses, 25%. So actually you guys had a bit more than that. Um, and uh, I think there's a lot of abortions in this. This, this data is a few years older now. So um, maybe we're having less losses these days due to abortion because of the increased use in fact vaccines but it's a, still a decent chunk of these lambs are lost in the neonatal period so in the in those first two days and how many of those are due to poor colostrum management um, my bet would be that it is quite a few so and uh, I will admit I've stolen this slide from uh, Flock Health Limited Fiona Lovett because I think it's a really good slide some of you might have seen it before um, but how do we stop those, those neonatal losses occurring? Um, we need to first think about the ewe. So the ewe needs to be fit and well-fed, in good body condition, good diet, good vaccination protocol, not lame, um, dagged and clean. And these things will all help to um, get the colostrum as good as it can be. Then um, the planning. So in order to minimize your losses and have good lambing success, planning is key. Um, things like the diet, the care of the newborns, having the same protocol for everybody that works in the lambing period in the barn. How do you maximize colostrum? How do you minimize stress to the lambs and the ewes? Um, how do you monitor colostrum quality and transfer? So I'm gonna go through a lot of these, these things in the plan section. Um, this is really what this talk is about and then prevent. So if they're being lambed outside, do they have shelter? If they're inside, is it clean and hygienic and not crowded? Um, bedding is, is one of the cheapest, uh, easiest things that can actually reduce infection rates. Turn out as soon as possible, again, as long as the weather allows it. Good hygiene, um, this is the most important thing you can do, I would say, and clean and disinfecting equipment. So I just, I like this slide because it kind of encompasses everything um, that we need to do. So first of all, we're going to go into um, you management to boost colostrum quality. And um, this is actually a good time for this talk because we've, we're kind of in tupping or we've just come past tupping. And um, we're now going to be thinking about how do we manage those pregnant ewes as they will be. So we're, we're giving ourselves a good amount of time now. The ewes are pregnant. There's, hopefully we're not going to be lambing um, until next year or early on next year or sometime next year. So we've got time to plan. Um, so nutrition of the ewes, um, and this is really important. If the ewe is uh, got undernutrition uh, or she's you know underweight, the colostrum will be poor. That's a you know a, a key fact. So getting the ewe nutrition right will affect the whole lamb's life, and. Um, you lambs are quite different to uh, normal, you know, well, not normal use, but older use. Uh, so I think it's always important to manage the ewe lambs as a separate group. Um, their nutrition requirements are different. They're growing as well as being pregnant. So they are going to need uh, a more specific nutrition plan. Things like minerals, which have, apparently there's been a lot of talk about minerals in the last couple of days here, um, but cobalt deficiency um, might mean that the lambs are slower to suck and, and will be weaker and less, less uh, vigorous. Selenium deficiency, again, slower to suck and more susceptible to cold and getting disease in general. So it's very important to um, get your nutrition uh, sorted and this is a perfect time to do it. Also, just a note about scanning, um, I, always, I think scanning, if you can do it, is really useful just because then you know how many um, lambs each ewe is carrying. You can split them into groups accordingly and then feed them accordingly. Uh, a lamb carrying three, a ewe carrying three lambs will obviously need very different um, nutrition to one that's carrying only one lamb. Underfeeding in pregnancy can lead to quite a lot of severe problems. 
So if you are um, underfeeding in the early stages of pregnancy, which is up to 50 days, uh, you're actually less likely for the ewe to get in lamb themselves. So this is why we have our flushing period before um, topping. Um, so uh, poor conception rates, uh, if they do get in, in lamb, they're more likely to resorb it and come back as being empty. Um, and uh, fetal ovarian development. So this means that the lamb that is inside the ewe, their own reproductive system won't grow as well if their mother is um, underweight. So by feeding the ewe, you're also ensuring the future reproductive um, productivity of that lamb. It seems amazing when you think about it, um, but this has been proven in sheep and cattle that uh, the nutrition of the, uh, the, the mother really affects that, that, that baby throughout its whole life. Um, between 30 and 90 days, so this is when the placenta is developing and, and the placenta is obviously super important for uh, giving the lamb the nutrition it needs. Um, so if the placenta is not developing properly due to undernutrition of the ewe, this means the lamb won't be able to grow and um, will be small and, and maybe sort of deformed. 100 days onwards, um, then this is when the lamb is really in that growing phase. So um, the, the ewe is going to be putting a lot of her energy into that lamb for it to grow um, as much as it can do and its health so it, when it's born it's, its health and vigor will be affected by the use nutrition in that period um, and then again once you get past 100 days this is when the ewe starts producing colostrum in her udder and um, if she is under if, if she's underweight and, and her nutrition isn't good enough she will produce less colostrum and it will be less good quality so um, that really makes a massive difference energy and fat levels of the colostrum will be affected too just going to check the Q&A. No, nothing at the moment. If you have any questions as I'm going along, please do um, pop them in the Q&A and I'll uh, keep an eye on that. So um, obviously different sheep are different and depending on where, uh, what sort of sheep you have or where your farm is, you will be aiming for different body condition score. Um, I, I would hope most, or if not all farmers, um, do know how to body condition score sheep. If you don't, certainly do ask your vet to show you how. It isn't too difficult. And um, we score them out of five, and you know, one being emaciated and five being obese. So what we're looking at is um, that they are these certain condition scores at certain times weaning will be the time when they are their lowest because they've been feeding that lamb for quite a long time and um you know they will have lost weight during during feeding that feeding so the lamb is taken away and this is your opportunity this is the time now to get the body condition score up um ready for lambing so if you can get the body condition score up now they um can normally maintain that pretty well so at tupping is when you want them to be the kind of the fattest they would be um obviously not super too fat because then they won't get in lamb either but say if you're looking at a hill you which is, is generally going to be carrying less weight um that you want them to be two and a half um at tupping and then they can maintain that during pregnancy uh, upland ewes are free um at tupping and lowland ewes can be a three and a half during mid pregnancy they will lose some of that weight because they are uh, you know putting their, their energy into the lamb and then at lambing again they will they will have lost weight um so you want them you're basically assuming they're going to lose a whole body condition score um between tupping and, and lambing or weaning um so they they do need to be slightly fatter well i don't want to say fat but they want to be carrying like slightly more weight than you would normally have them at tupping in order for them to maintain that throughout Um, and obviously the health of the ewe will affect the health of the lamb, but also the colostrum. So things like hypocalcemia, twin lamb disease, you know, uh, problems with nutrition will, will predispose to these problems. So if you're getting problems like this at lambing, it, it's, you need to look at your uh, pregnant ewe nutrition. Prolapses again, uh, obviously if they are too fat, then they can be uh, more prone to getting prolapses, but um, e equally if they are too thin, they can also get prolapses. Um, so this is something which if you're getting a lot of prolapses, you need to again, look at their nutrition. Lameness, um, if they're lame, they won't be able to walk to the food and eat as much. And so they will be underweight very likely. So um, lameness is not gonna be helpful to you. Abortion. Uh, you know, obviously never good. Um, listeria and other colostral diseases. So any, any disease, you know, these, these being the most common examples will, will affect the colostrum. Um, because if a, if a ewe is, uh, you know, trying to fight off a disease, her body won't then be focusing on making the colostrum and giving the energy to the lamb. It will be 
focusing on fighting off the disease. So this is why we really need to make sure that you is as healthy as she can be. And then the body can, her body can focus on what it needs to do, which is make that colostrum and keep the lamb healthy. Fluke and worms, uh, we see this a lot in uh, sheep, which are um, underweight and riddled with worms. And um, then, you know, something else tips them over the edge. So if you can control the fluke and the worms and keep the weight uh, at a good level, the sheep will then be able to pretty much deal with most things. So yeah, like I said, um, you nutrition is, is very important. And if you're not sure that things are, uh, if you think things could be not quite right, do consider forage analysis. This isn't a talk on nutrition. I think this is as much as I'm gonna say on that. Um, but yeah, and you can change the, the ration where it's needed. If they're singles, they all need a different ration to uh, triplets. Feeding, uh, make sure they have enough space to feed. So six inches per you, and they should always be able to eat as much forage as they can get. Um, you know, forage isn't something you want to skimp on. And it's, you know, they are designed to be continually chewing and eating. That's what they need. So they need to have continuous access to that. Concentrates, um, a bit more space, so 18 inches uh, per you. Make sure the trough is clean and um, that the food is fresh and not, you know, if it's just left for 24 hours and then you put new food on top of it, that will spoil the new food. So uh, it sounds obvious, but it's amazing how often it happens. Um, or you can feed it off the floor as long as the floor is clean and always, always make sure they've got fresh water. Um, the requirement for use in pregnancy of water, it, it goes up considerably because they, they need, uh, they're making, you know, they're making colostrum, they, um, they've got a lamb inside them. And again, when, once they've given birth to the lamb, they'll be producing milk, so they will need more water. Um, we had quite a few people here who had upland or hill um, flocks and so you know you might be lambing outdoors and uh, although nature will provide to some extent nutrition is still really important it is difficult to assess nutrition from grass um, there's been some more interesting studies uh, done recently in the last year where they looked at um, profitability of flocks and um, a bit about nutrition so flocks where um, they they kind of kept an eye on the they did forage anal analysis of the grass itself and um, they fertilized the grass actually were more profitable so although sometimes it feels expensive to be going and putting fertilizer down um, actually this will mean the grass does give that those sheep more um, back and so you will end up you know recruiting uh, uh, that cost make sure you don't um, stress them out too much before lambing so if you're going to move them down from the hill to lamb make sure you do that decent time before at least two weeks uh, make sure they've got plenty of water and they can access it uh, easily um, make sure you know where you're going to put them after lambing and uh, make sure you've got a plan as we know not uh, well we've had some really bad years the last few years last year wasn't too bad but obviously there's that year where everyone remembers the bees from the east so um yeah make sure you have a contingency plan so we don't want that to happen again if you have sick ones if you can pull them out and put them somewhere else that is a very useful thing to be able to do So we're getting to closer now to lambing. We're um, for flocks that are not lambing outside. So if you're lambing inside, you're going to be housing them. And um, you know the main thing is not to crowd them in and to keep them clean and hygienic. So they need to be able to lie down if they want to. They need to be able to move around. They need to, be able to get to the food. Um, they don't necessarily want to touch each other because you know they have a complicated social hierarchy, and um, they so they need to be able to get to not feel trapped where they are and be able to get to what they need to get recommendations are uh, you know 1.2 to 1.4 square meter per sheep one thing that I found really good um, really useful and quite cheap is a laser uh, measurer that builders use so it's like a little laser pen and you can stand at one end of the barn and direct the laser to the other end and it will measure you if you're not sure of how big the barn is it measures the length of the barn in meters and then you can stand and do the um, the width of the barn and then work out how big your barn is that way they're only about 10, 20 30 pounds from amazon and um because i do a bit of housing assessments i found it very useful so i can quickly work out the size of the barn and then um, work out how many sheep that barn can take so i think if you are not sure um of the barn size and this is a nice little gadget and we all like a gadget now and again uh straw clean straw very important um you know 
this infection is, is much easier to spread around if they're indoors and crowded together. Lime, I'm a big advocate of lime, especially in the gateways and in the lambing pens, um, because it just keeps it dry and it will destroy infectious agents, particularly ones like Dicolobacter that causes lame uh, foot rot and um, you know other kinds of bacteria and viruses. So, so I'm, I'm a big fan of lime. Uh, keep the stress down, try not to do too many movings and handlings while they're in that late stage of pregnancy because there is the risk of abortions. Um, so for pens, if you um, have 13 pens per 100 ewes, uh, that can normally be enough, although if the lambing is very compact, you might want more. Um, obviously, fresh feed and water at all times. She needs, particularly around that lambing point, the ewe really does need plenty of fresh water. Clean between lambings. Um, particularly if you've had a ewe abort, you know, that is, I would say, literally remove the ewe, remove everything that's in that pen, burn it, uh, throw, the, throw the bonfire off a bridge. You know, it, you, it's so infectious. Some, some abortions are so infectious um, and you can really save yourself massive issues if you um, are very good with your biosecurity on those. Um, if they're sick, ideally, if they're sick, you want to have somewhere that's away from the rest of them to house them as well. Somebody's put shavings versus straw for bedding. Oh, it's a good question. Um, I prefer straw myself. I think as long as you make sure to replace it and um, keep it clean. So, um, cause shavings can get quite damp and um, mushy. I think, I think fresh, string, fresh clean straw is better. If you're gonna use shavings, I would definitely put lime underneath them and try not to deep bed them because you just end up with some what looks like clean shavings on the top but then a layer of wetness underneath so um yeah for me i prefer straw but other people if they've got if anyone's got any comments on that um do put them in the chat because i'd be interested to hear if anyone else has uh, got any comments on straw versus shavings that's my personal opinion right so now we've, we've done everything we can for the for the you. Um, she's she's looking good. She's in good shape. So she's given birth. And now we need to focus on the colostrum and the lamb. Um, so, yes, I will admit I've stolen this picture as well from Flock Health Limited. But I just quite like it because it's like the golden colostrum in the you and then the, the, battery, the little lamb here with its battery. Um, and you can imagine it's quite a good um, if you like a visual. You can imagine the battery is um, empty, uh, you know, like your phone at the end of the day. And then by putting that colostrum into the lamb, you're charging it full. Um, so I quite like that. Another poll. What is your approach? And hopefully Katie is uh, not run off for a cup of tea. What is your approach for colostrum management? So do you, um, hopefully the poll come up, there it is. Hopefully, um, so you could leave the lambs to it. You could tube or bottle feed lambs colostrum if they need it, or you could uh, tube or bottle feed every lamb. So what do you do? This is interesting for me as well. And obviously it will depend on partly, um, you know, if you're outdoor lambing or indoor lambing. And I do appreciate if you're outdoor lambing, you're not going to tube every lamb. <laughs> it's a, a limit to our patients in these situations. So we'll just hang about while that gets answered. I'm just going to make sure there's no more Q and A's. Hopefully you're all still awake. So we've just closed the poll. Okay, um, so we've got leave the lambs to it, which is uh, 7%. So yeah, I mean, I imagine some of these are the, uh, uh, some of the hill people. Um, tube or bottle fed lambs is the, is the big answer. So 93% have said tube or bottle feed lambs if they need it. And nobody actually tube or bottle feeds every lamb. Um, I don't think it's wrong to do that in certain situations, particularly if you've had problems in the past, but equally it's very um, high intensive in management. So yeah, not ideal. So I think, yeah, if they need it is correct, but it, it's about making sure you know when they need it and being uh, very uh, up on it. So, you know, noticing when they need it quickly and getting that colostrum down them as quickly as possible. So um, we're going to go into a bit more detail about colostrum and, and how we can maximise its effect to our best um, ability. So I like to think of it as the five cues. Um, this has kind of been taken from management of colostrum in, in calves, but it, it really does apply to sheep as well. And um, it's the first and the best thing you can do for the newborn lamb. It really is. It contains IgG, which is the immunoglobulins, the uh, immunity that it needs, but it also contains many other good things some of which we don't even understand very well at the moment. You know, there's more and more research coming out about what's in colostrum and some things we, we never even knew that they were there, um, but they're giving that lamb so much benefit. 
So the first cue is quickly. Um, so quickly means quickly, you know, you want to get it in as ASAP. Um, U colostrum is 50 grams of IgG per litre at lambing, but this declines rapidly and by 24 to 46 hours old, a lamb cannot absorb it. So it's really that first 24 hours, the lamb, um, the lamb's gut, we kind of call it, we call it is open, but it means what can happen is the colostrum goes into the gut and then it can actually, the IgGs can pass through the wall of the gut and into the bloodstream. Um, and by, then they go into the bloodstream and then they can um, fight off any infection and disease when they're there, but this stops at about 24 hours of age. And so you need to get that colostrum in as early as possible in order for this to happen. I see a question. I have a colostrum store from last lambing in the freezer. Will it be okay to use this coming lambing? Yes, okay, so you can freeze colostrum 100%. Um, you wanna make sure the colostrum you have frozen is clean. And um, when you thaw that colostrum, you want to not do it in a microwave, but you want to do it in a water bath, no warmer than 40 degrees centigrade. I would not store colostrum any longer than a year. I think a year is probably the max on that one. I will go into this in a bit more detail, but no, good, good question. Um, so a four kilogram lamb requires 20 grams of IgG as quickly as possible for adequate passive transfer. And we normally say within the first four to six hours. So I know it's tiring and you want to sleep, but if a lamb is born at 1 a.m., it really needs to get colostrum in before five to 6 a.m. Uh, it's not fun. Hopefully you'll have a vet student who can do it for you. Okay. Quantity, so that's the second cue. Uh, eucolostrum is 15% fat. This fat is so important because at birth, um, lambs have a store of energy in their brown fat, um, but this is uh, sort of their emergency supply. And it, they, it's, it's um, brown fat is what they surrounds the intestines. So it's their emergency supply in the, in the abdomen. This is used up very fast, particularly if they're born outside in the cold, because they, they need to burn that fat to keep warm and, and alive, essentially. So um, this, this is burnt very quickly. Um, and by five hours, there's very little there. So they must get 200 mils per kg colostrum in the first 24 hours simply to keep warm, not even for anything else. Um, and often what we'll see at post-mortem, if we have these lambs that die in the first 24 to 48 hours, we'll see, we'll look in the abdomen and we'll see that brown fat is completely gone. And then we'll look in the um, stomach and we'll see that there's no colostrum in there. And that's, so basically these lambs have, have died because they've got no resources left. Um, so all lambs really must receive 50 mils per kilo colostrum as soon as possible and a total of 200 mils per kilo before the end of 24 hours. That's a, um, a given. And, you know, we know that just by suckling alone, if they're suckling hard for 20 minutes, um, they have to suckle continuously for about 20 minutes in order to get um, the amount of colostrum that they need for the first few hours. So they actually do need to suckle for, a, you know, a decent length of time to get that colostrum. So if they don't look like they're suckling um, and they're just down and looking kind of, you know, those are the ones I would definitely go in and tube them or bottle feed if they'll take it. Okay, so let's carry on with the five cues. Squeaky clean. I know it's not technically a cue, but there is a cue in there. I should have put the cue in a uh, capital letter maybe. Um, so everything must be clean because basically, like I said, the gut is open and this allows proteins and immunoglobulins through into the bloodstream, but this also allows bacteria into the bloodstream. So um, if you have everything super clean, um, hopefully this will not introduce any more bacteria than is already there. So if you're storing colostrum, it, the, the containers must be sterilized. Um, if you're or tubing them, you must sterilize the tube between um, between tubings. Um, in order to sterilize, I would um, first wash with disinfectant, um, then rinse, and then um, you can use boiling water, but you just have to be careful if, you, if you're going to use boiling water, make sure you've washed it with disinfectant first because you can end up just baking on um, the colostrum or the films onto the tubes. And also if you boil the, the lambing tubes, the, the, the feeding tubes, sometimes it makes them go hard and crack. And so actually they're not, quite, not very suitable then for, for feeding lambs with. So um, you don't necessarily need to boil everything, but certainly do want to disinfect and sterilise. Um, you can keep colostrum in the fridge for up to a week as long as it's clean and um, or you can freeze in small portions um, and if you want to uh, like somebody just asked if you want to then use that you can defrost it but just not in the microwave use a warm water bath and um, 
it really will help as well if the if everything's clean around the lamb so like if the used udder is clean if mainly because the bedding is clean you know the udder is on the bedding so if the bedding is clean the udder will be clean and the ewe will be clean um if the bedding is damp and dirty and has bacteria all over it her udder will then obviously be in the bedding when she lies down then the lamb will be licking that udder to try and get the, the milk and the bacteria will go straight into its mouth so um, clean bedding is the key for this the fourth cue is quality. So good quality. How do we know it is? Certain sheep will have better quality colostrum than others. Um, a particularly milky ewe uh, who's producing large volumes of colostrum actually might be slightly more diluted. So the quality might be poorer. Um, ewes that are like ewe lambs because they've only been exposed to kind of one year or, or year, two years of um, pathogens might actually have less good quality than a ewe that's uh, three or four years old. So um, if you're having problems with lambs dying and, and you're worried about um, the quality of the colostrum, you can test this. It's something called a Brooks refractometer. You can buy it again from Amazon. I don't work for them, I promise. Um, but you can buy them from Amazon or wherever. And they actually were designed for um, making beer. So for, for testing the density of beer. And that's all they are. They're a, dens a density meter. So you can put a drop of the colostrum on the little window there and you look through and it tells you how much protein there is in it. Um, and so for sheep, you want to uh, have a cutoff of 21%. So anything over 21%, great, perfect anything under that uh, I wouldn't throw it down the drain necessarily but I would maybe save it for later feeding so you can save the good colost quality colostrum for the first feed and then maybe the slightly less good quality colostrum you can give for subsequent feedings um, if again you're not sure about this and uh, the vets can take uh, blood samples so you can blood sample a um, selection of lambs and uh, see if they've had enough colostrum that way so the, the vet can come and do this and, and check and, and if if they're all very low you know something's going wrong here and, and you can work to um, try and sort that out and this is sort of leading me into the fourth the fifth cue which is quantify so quantify basically means measure and um, so you want to I would say if you are having problems uh, in the first 48 hours of lambing with lambs dying not sure why you need to look at the colostrums first thing you need to do so first of all you need to make sure they're getting the colostrum are they getting enough colostrum and if you if you're sure they are then you need to see about this this um, quality and blood sampling because this will really give you that kind of quantifiable data um, and so yeah get your vet to come take some blood samples and um, they can check to see if they're getting enough and if and then we can work out back then we can work backwards so if the quality is not good enough that's probably due to the fact the ewes are not getting good enough nutrition if the quantity is not good enough there must be a reason why they're not taking on enough or maybe you need to tube, tube feed more lambs so you can get, actually gather a lot of information there and there's so much you can do with colostrum as well to quite a few easy things you can do that will improve the colostrum and make a massive difference at lambing time um, so this can happen. What if the ewe hasn't got her own colostrum? And we know this can be a problem. Um, I would say if you can get a bit of a bank of um, some frozen colostrum in just in case type scenarios. Um, so if you have a, you know, a good producing single um, and she's very milky and she's got lots of colostrum, you can certainly take some from her and freeze that. Or if it's a ewe that loses her lambs and, but she's still producing colostrum, um, that can, you can then either keep it in the fridge as long as you use it within um, 24, 48 hours or you can freeze it for next time and I definitely think it's very useful to have that. Um, you can use goat colostrum, uh, it's not as good as you but it's better than uh, the other alternatives. Cow colostrum again can be uh, used but it is more dilute and uh, 30 so you need to give 30 percent more in quantity and also you can have an uh, it is a rare but uh, there is a risk of a rare um, anemia reaction whereby the you um, sorry the lamb is allergic to uh, the proteins in the cow's colostrum so there is a slight risk of that so I probably would uh, still steer, steer clear of cows um, if possible and then um, also worth having just a bucket of uh, powdered colostrum, you know, for the very last resort, better than certainly better than nothing. Um, yeah, it, you can make it up. It's nowhere near as good as the colostrum from the use on your farm, but it's a useful thing to have uh, just in case. However, um, do be wary slightly of, of um, these powdered colostrums because there have been studies to show that um, the quant, uh, sorry, the quality is very variable depending on where you buy it from 
And um, so I'd say have it, but um, be aware that, you know, you will need to give the lamb quite a lot more and the quality is, is, is variable. Uh, here is some re results from that study and uh, I feel a bit naughty showing the actual um, shops where they bought this colostrum from but they basically looked at the IgG in the in these powdered colostrums and measured them so you can see some are certainly a lot better than others and so I if I was going to buy them I would steer, steer clear of some of those um, and buy the ones that are higher I don't want to go into that in too much detail but this was a published study so but the main point we have here is that uh, powder colostrum is very variable and it's very much a last resort cool so um, disease prevention and as I said before this is what we want maternally derived antibodies so this is what the, the lamb gets when it suckles the colostrum the antibodies are made in the ewes um, body they pass into the colostrum the lamb suckles that colostrum and gets the antibodies that way and the antibodies fight disease in the lamb until it can produce its own immunity it's different to um, human babies when a human baby is in the womb the antibodies can pass through the placenta from the mother to the baby before it's even born but in lamb lambs and in, in calves as well, the placenta is really thick um, and so they get nothing until they're born and take on that colostrum. So they are 100% reliant on that colostrum to prevent disease. Once, you, once they've got a bit older, like two weeks or so, they start to um, produce their own immunity and um, vaccination will certainly help as well to, to boost it. So I'm going to move into this sort of third section, which is about vaccination in general. So um, in this poll, um, hopefully Katie will put it up in a minute. Uh, which vaccines do you give to use either pre-tupping or during pregnancy? So um, some of you might do all of them, in which case you get a golden star. But uh, yes, do have a um, tick any which you do use. And we will I won't talk about all of them in lots of detail, but I will um, cover some of them and why they're important. So I'll just give you a couple of minutes to do that. Probably took a bit too long talking about colostrum, but I love talking about colostrum. <laughs> I'll try not to uh, go over time. So um, the choices are no vaccines, clostridial vaccines, pastorella vaccines. Some vaccines contain clostridial and pastorella, so like heptavac P. So if you use a heptavac P, you can take both of those. Or oh, lamesness, I spelled that wrong. Um, uh, ORF. Um, toxivax or enzootic abortion. So those are the choices. Just having a quick check on the chat. Oof, that's a, a, it's a, uh, a long question in the chat, which I might save till the end, because that sounds like a, a long answer that is needed for that. But yeah, I'll save that one till the end. Okay, so um, we've got the results here of the poll. Which vaccines do you give? So 4%, which is none, um, only one person there, which is, is good. Clostridial, and most people are giving clostridial vaccines and that's great because if, um, I always think every you really should get clostridial vaccine and um, it, it's just it's just a no brainer. It, it, they're such common diseases which you cannot prevent through biosecurity or isolation or having a close flock. Um, you know, and the vaccines are cheap. There's no reason not to do clostridial, vac um, clostridial. And, you know, things like pulpy kidney, um, very common lamb diseases are caused by these clostridial toxins. So clostridial vaccines are most important. Pastorella, very common again, you know, a big killer of sheep and lambs. And so we've got 67% of people doing that, great. 33% vaccinating for uh, lamesness, <laughs> which is um, uh, foot vax, and then 8% vaccinating for ORF. For ORF, you don't need to vaccinate unless you actually have problems with ORF. So I say, if you've got problems with ORF, definitely vaccinate. If you don't have problems with ORF, don't start. 38% uh, using Toxivax, tox Toxo, and 29% uh, using enzootic abortion. I'm just gonna take a quick picture of this for my own interest thank you cool so that's interesting i think there's a lot of good vaccination going on here and um uh, yeah let's let's do a bit more about this so here's the standard the classic heptavac p plus um this covers clostridial disease and pastorella and i think this is a, should be a, the sort of the vaccine that everyone should use and i'd say that even if i didn't work for msd who conveniently make it um, because i think it is not expensive and it, you know we lose so many sheep and lambs to these diseases every year 
Uh, it's got seven clostridial strains and two pastorella. Um, it is given, so you give it to lambs and you also give it to ewes. We'll talk about the, the protocol for this because I know that can be a bit confusing. So um, I will go into the protocol for this, but you basically boost the, the ewes in pregnancy and the antibodies are proven to then pass through into the colostrum and protect the lamb for the first few weeks. Then you can vaccinate the lambs from three weeks of age and protect them going forward. Um, it's got IRP technology, which just means it covers all strains of pastorella, which is great. Um, so some people just want to, or they just vaccinate for clostridial only, and the vaccine is Provoxin 10. This um, does not have the pastorella component, but covers 10 different uh, strains of, of clostridial. So it's, um, for, for me, I would always use Heptavac P as my starting point. If you then find you have animals dying of clostridial disease, there are three types of clostridial which aren't covered in Heptavac P. And if you're unlucky enough to have those on your farm, then Brevoxin is probably for you. Um, but otherwise you don't necessarily need to use it. Um, the only other reason people do use it is because it can also be given to cattle. And so it's maybe easier just to have the same vaccine on the farm for everything. I would um, if I was going to use this vaccine, I would always use it with a pasturella on top. So you would want to then add in a pasturella vaccine because this vaccine does not cover pasturella and it's such a common cause of deaths. Um, but it's given in a very similar way to Heptavac P, can be given in pregnancy again, and it will pass on the, on the um, benefit to the lambs through the colostrum again. So um, yeah, it's a good vaccine. You can vaccinate the lambs from two weeks of age with this. But if again, if you're using this in lambs, I would still be keen to put in a pasturella, um, an extra pasturella vaccine, because uh, lambs can die from pasturella from like one to two weeks of age. And that lasts 12 months again. Um, so this is a good, a, a good slide, which I like to use. Um, I think it sort of nicely shows the um, why we vaccinate. So if you think about this um, on the far left hand side, we've got lambing here. Um, I'm just trying to move if I can. Oh gosh, nope, that was bad. Let's put that down again. I was trying to get my laser pen out, but it doesn't want to. Never mind. Um, so lambing here. We've got um, passive protection against pastorella, so that the lamb takes on the colostrum. It's got protection against pastorella, which lasts about three weeks, um, and then passive protection against clostridia, which lasts up to a few months. Um, this, as you can see here, the blue and the green, they're, they're going down and um, you get this sort of dip, this, this um, dip in immunity between um, when the passive protection wears off and then the active protection starts up. So um, the key thing here is to really try and get your vaccines in as early as possible because you really want to um, eliminate this trough. This is a trough of bad immunity, like the trough of badness. So the smaller you can make this trough, the better, um, because this is where the lamb's going to be most uh, prone to getting disease. So um, it's always in that, you know, often in that sort of six week period. So if you can get, get your um, first dose in from sort of two to three weeks of age and your second dose in uh, four to six weeks later, you get your active protection up and, and, and ready, um, hopefully before that passive protection goes too low. So you're minimizing the the size of that trough and you really need to you need your first vaccine and your booster because if you just give your first vaccine you do not get that second massive increase in immunity it will just sort of dwarl along at the bottom here rather than getting going up and up where it needs to be so you've got to have your, your, your two doses and um, this will then protect the lambs going forward So um, in terms of the regimes, uh, I'll just try to do this not too slowly. Um, Heptavac, as I said, boost to four to six weeks before lambing. Provoxin, two to eight weeks before lambing. And this will provide passive protection to lambs. So this would be my bog standard. Um, Heptavac is what I would use. Oh, OK. So we have a question. How long does the pasturella part of Heptavac P and Alvavac P last? There seems to be a suggestion that we should be boostering springborn lambs again in the autumn. Yes, so this is this is something that um, is kind of farm specific. So um, the pasturella component, the vaccine is licensed for a year, but the pasturella component can um, wane in the second six months. And so I would say if you're on a farm where you've had losses in the past in autumn due to pasturella, you know that you're um, you must have a very high challenge there. And so I would. Be quite keen if, if you've had losses in the past to boost those lambs with you don't need to do the whole heptavac again you could just do an ovi past um, but a pasturella booster before that risk period because um yes you can you can on a farms with a high challenge you can get still losses from pasturella um due to it being in that second six month period so yeah that's a good question 
Um, second question, does clostridial vaccine, uh, Covexin or um, Brevoxin 10, if you do it properly, does it give 100% guarantee sheep won't die from clostridial disease? <laughs> yes, so no, um, no vaccine is 100% guaranteed, I'm sorry. And um, I, to be honest, I will be happy if I vaccinated 500 sheep and I still had five deaths of clostridial, I would still consider that the vaccine's done a good job because um, if you didn't vaccinate them, you'd probably get 50 die of clostridial. Do you know what I mean? So it, it, you're never going to get a 100% guarantee, but what you are going to get is a massively reduced issue. So um, sheep love to die and um, we'll never fully prevent that probably. But if you can vaccinate them, you're going to massively reduce the, the, the losses that you do get. Uh, one more question. Does maternally derived immunity block the vaccine response like it would with dog vaccines? Who's a clever person here? Um, yes, it can do. So this is why we can't give um, vaccines any younger than two weeks um, because the maternally derived antibody um, can block the vaccine response. So it's a fine balance. You want to give the vaccine as young as possible in order to get protection on board, but you don't want to give it so young that it won't work because of the maternally derived antibody. So yes, that you're right, it does do that. And so this is why you need to follow the data sheet very carefully. Some good questions there, love it. Um, thank you for those. So let's keep going. Um, replacements, don't forget them. And certainly don't trust anyone who says, uh, if you say to them, oh, have you vaccinated your sheep? And they go, like, oh yes, they're on the system. Uh, don't trust that because you don't know what that means. So I would always revaccinate them um, because you just can't be sure. And um, so do your full primary course, um, uh, two injections, four to six weeks apart for replacements. Lambs. Um, you've got a couple of choices here from three weeks of age um, with Heptavac, or it would be two weeks if you're using Brevoxin. Um, you can do full primary course and two injections of Heptavac. Ovivac um, is very similar to Heptavac, except for you would give it to lambs, lambs only that you're probably going to send away, um, not lambs that you're going to keep for replacements. Um, this is because the Ovivac does not protect against those very early lamb diseases uh, like pulpy kidney and lamb dysentery. So you wouldn't give Ovivac P to pregnant animals because you're not going to be getting any benefit from it that way. And you wouldn't give it to uh, lambs that you're going to keep um, for breeding. You may as well just give them Heptavac P because then you can continue the course rather than having to restart. So Ovivac P, slightly cheaper, but if you're going to keep those sheep, then I would um, just do them with Heptavac to be honest. Okay, oh, I think there's a chat. Let me just double check the chat. Yes, thanks, Mike Hutch, <laughs> my friend from MSD. He's also Sid Struck and Black's disease. Yeah, I mean, there's loads of them. Um, Mike is a, a sheep expert. He probably knows more than I do. Right, so other vaccines um, we, we can also give either um, during pregnancy or beforehand. So um, lameness, we don't want you to be lame. Uh, you can vaccinate uh, using foot vax during pregnancy, as long as you don't do it too close to lambing or tupping. Um, and um, so yeah, that can be done. Orf, again, it can be used during pregnancy um, in, in use and or it can be given to lambs. Um, after 24 hours of age. Toxo, this you would give pre-tupping um, and, and so you would give pre-tupping because you want to, these are abortion vaccines, so you would want to get your protection in before they are tupped so that they're protected for the whole duration of pregnancy. Um, so do consider if you don't do any of these and you're getting problems um, that there are plenty of, um, you know, vaccines out there for these diseases, particularly as we are now um, very, there's a very high focus on trying to reduce antibiotics and antibiotics for lameness and abortion are the two uh, highest use of antibiotics in the sheep farming industry. So, and both of them can be prevented um, with a vaccination. So if you're using high level of antibiotics for either abortion or lameness, it might be time to sit back and, and think about um, what you can do that, that to, to reduce that use. Um, so if you're going to spend some money on a vaccine, um, at least the very least you can do is make it work properly for you by avoiding common mistakes. So um, do double check the dose. Uh, don't give half a dose to an animal that you think is small. That isn't going to work. Um, make sure you check the timing. So I know the data sheets are very tiny writing, um, but we do have on our website uh, sort of um, info on all the products. So if you don't like looking at the data sheet because it's so small, you can check on our website. Um, 
vaccine should be kept in the fridge and the fridge needs to be working at two to eight degrees. Uh, we, one of my, um, the vets working in my company did a, uh, ex a bit of a research on fridges on farms and he visited a whole load of farms and he measured the average uh, temperature of the fridges over a six month period. And all of them uh, had variations outside of the normal range. People often uh, get their new fridge for their kitchen and then use the old dodgy fridge for the farm to keep the vaccines in. Um, if you think about how much you spent on your uh, weekly shop, which is maybe £100, and then how much do you spend on your vaccines, maybe £2,000, maybe you should use your new fridge in the farm and use your old fridge in your kitchen. Um, so yes, make sure your fridge is working. Um, make sure you give the booster within 12 months or um, sooner, depending on the data sheet. And don't forget your RAMs and your empty sheep at scanning. So RAMs, they're really important. Um, they can get lame too. They can get die of clostridial disease. They are expensive. Um, so make sure you do vaccinate your RAMs. Sheep, if they're empty, this can happen quite commonly. So they're given Heptavac one year. They're then scanned. They're found to be empty. They're put in the field of all the others. They're not given Heptavac that year. And so then they go two years before they get the next booster. Um, so that's not enough. You'll need to restart those sheep. So if, if they're empty, still give them their Heptavac because next year when they're not empty, you won't then have to restart the course. I've just got another Q&A. When would you start the primary vaccination of Heptavac on recently bought sheep that you were unsure vaccinated before? Yes, so I would try, uh, well it depends on what stage they're in, so if they are not pregnant, you can start the um, vaccination, probably, I'd probably tup them first, so if you're buying them like just before tupping, I'd buy them, tup them, and then start the vaccination course in pregnancy to coincide with giving the second dose in that four to six week period before lambing. Um, if they are, if you're buying them at another time of the year, I would start it probably as soon as possible, maybe give them a week to settle into your farm. Um, and then you can start the vaccination while they're preferably in isolation. Um, you can start the vaccination course then. So you want to do two vaccines four to six weeks apart. Cool. Let's keep. Um, we do have some videos online. Um, the website is there at the bottom underneath the picture. And um, even if you think you're, you're an expert in, in vaccinating, um, there's still things we can all learn, I think. And uh, so have a look at these. They're very useful. Things like the sheep need to be clean and dry. Handle the vaccine carefully. Shake the bottle to mix it before you vaccinate. Using a steromatic vaccinator, which is this one in the picture, this will sterilise the needle every time it injects. So the needle passes through a chamber with sterilant in it. And um, it's just things like um, Heptavac doesn't actually contain preservative in it. And so um, if the needle gets uh, dirty and you're continually putting the same needle into that bottle, you're gonna be um, making that bottle a breeding ground of bacteria. So it's just simple things like that, which will really help to make sure you get the most out of the vaccine. Um, try not to use other treatments at the same time. So um, an animal can only really respond to uh, a certain number of things that you do to it. So if you're vaccinating it, plus, um, you know, drenching it with something, plus doing something else to it, you know, its immune system is going to be like, whoa, I can't, I can't handle all this. Um, so try not to do too much to it all at one, one time. And if it's sick with something else, um, again, its immune system won't be able to respond to those vaccines. So do vaccinate healthy sheep only. One other question. I was planning on lambing outside then bringing ewes and lambs in for a few days to bond, but I've been told this could cause a lot of disease issues. Is this the case? Yes, I think um, if I were you and if the weather's okay, I'd probably just stay, keep them outside. Like, you know, in the, in the wild, they would bond fine outside anyway. And, um, you know, if you bring them, if you, it's stressful time anyway for them, like their immune systems are down. Um, I think moving them at that critical time would probably not be ideal. So if I were you, I would probably keep them where they are as long as the weather is uh, not too terrible. Or, or bring them inside two weeks before lambing and lamb inside. I think I wouldn't move them at that point that you have asked. If anyone has any, any comments on that, Again, that's an interesting one. Do put them in the chat. Um, so protocols. I think if you have a, um, a busy lambing period and you're lambing lots of sheep all at once, it's very, and you have different staff working for you, vet students, um, who don't necessarily know what they're doing, I would very much have colostrum protocols um, written in like red pen on a massive sticker somewhere. So, um, which lambs get colostrum. So you need to know, you need, people need to know before lambing, which lambs that you're gonna give colostrum to. So if you say, you know, um, what, are you, what are your criteria? 
i.e. you've been watching the lamb, it hasn't got up, it hasn't suckled for two hours, that lamb needs to get colostrum. So everyone needs to know what the criteria are. How much colostrum do they get? When do they get it? Who gives it to them? Are, is this person trained to put a tube down a lamb's throat and not drown them? This is, you know, these things are, are very important. If you're not, not sure, get your vet to show you. Cleanliness and hygiene protocols. How do you clean the tube between each lamb? Um, when do you need to call the vet? What other treatments do they get? Preferably not spectam for every single one. Um, and make sure everyone knows this and you've done it before lambing because during lambing is a super stressful time. You won't have time to be going around telling people what to do then. Um, and mistakes can be very costly. And particularly if you've got lots of different staff on and people are tired at lambing, people can make mistakes. So do make sure there are protocols and they can be followed. Someone's written something in the chat. Thank you. <laughs> it's okay, Scott, no probs. Um, so yeah, make sure they can see them. Uh, recording, this may seem boring, and I, you know, I'm not a, a massive figures person either, but um, I think if you can record the data one year, once everything's calmed down a bit, you can then sit down and look at it and see well, how things are actually going. So the sort of things I would record are like, you know, number of lambs born, um, number that died, when did they die, um, and, and why, if you know why, why did they die? So things like that. Um, so, you know, I, I know in the middle of the night, people are busy and tired. And if, there, if some lambs die, they might just um, dispose of them and, and forget to write them down. But you will, so, and particularly if there's a lot of losses, it can get very depressing. But you will thank yourself uh, later on when you can see that you've recorded this, you've then diagnosed what the problem is and you've made taken measures next year to stop it from happening again, because there's nothing more depressing than doing nothing about it and the same thing happening year on year. Um, again, if you go to our website, we have some really useful um, sort of uh, things to help you with this. So here's a lambing record sheet. Um, you can fill it in, you can put it up on the wall and fill it in. So just download that from our website. And many other things we also have on there. So do, do um, go and take a gander. Cool. One more question. Um, my flock missed their foot vax booster because before the rams went in because they have delayed MV test. Can I give their booster when I change the rattles or three weeks into tupping? Um, you want to be a, a bit careful about giving foot vax um, too close to tupping. So I would probably wait until they've um, finished tupping and they're pregnant and then give it another few weeks and then do it in pregnancy. Because I think um, if you if you give them foot vax during tupping, it may mean that you get some returns that you didn't want. So um, foot vax isn't too much of an issue. If you if you go over 12 months for foot vax, I wouldn't panic. This is the only vaccine I'll say this for um, because the other vaccines this doesn't apply. But for foot vax, it doesn't matter too much if you are a couple of months over. I would prefer you to vaccinate during pregnancy. OK. So summary, I, I, I've been very tight on time, I've been very uh, close to the time here, um, but we have had some really good questions actually throughout. So um, yes, I've, I've, it's been good. So colostrum is gold. It's the most important thing you can do for the lamb um, during its whole life. Please ensure that the pregnant you management and nutrition is top notch. You can be starting to think about that now. Remember the five cues. They um, are a really good way to uh, systematically assess your colostrum management. Make every lamb count. Every lamb does count. You, you can't afford to lose lambs, particularly as um, you know things go into Brexit, etc. Uh, if you can vaccinate for a prevent preventable disease, then do so. Um, don't rely on antibiotics. These will be removed from us eventually. And having protocols will make a big difference as well, particularly if you have uh, several people working on the farm uh, and different people each year. So great. I mean, and we've had some really good questions going through um, and uh, I've enjoyed answering them. I don't know if anyone has any more questions. I'm certainly happy to take them at this point. Um, or if not, then um, I will hand back to Katie. But yeah, if you do have a question, just pop it in the Q&A. And thank you very much for listening. OK. No more questions seem to be coming through. So um, thank you very much um, for that, Kat. Um, I think we did have a comment um, on the chat um, asking about sort of um, work experience and how to get involved in. Um, I think um, I can certainly email in terms of what NSA can do to help with somebody looking for work experience there. Um, and so I'll pick that one up if you if you like. Brilliant. Kat. Thank you.
Um, but uh, I think that is uh, it then for now. So just a reminder, if you've got a free afternoon and evening and you want to join any more of our webinars, we've got um, just two left from this little series we've been running for the past two days. Um, the next one is at three o'clock and is with Cars Billington. Um, we've heard about how forage analysis can be quite important and they're gonna be talking about that. Um, and then later on this evening, um, British Wool are joining us um, and they are going to just be talking about the current wool market um, and what their plans are moving forward. Um, we have just got another question um, there, Kat, and you've seen that one about Heptavac P. Yes. Um, do we vaccinate ewes? Is it necessary to vaccinate the lambs as well? Yes, it is. So if you if you vaccinate the ewes during pregnancy, um, the protection will go from um, the ewes into the lambs from the colostrum. And this will protect the lambs for the first few weeks of life, but that protection will wear off. So you do need to vaccinate the lambs from three weeks of age. Otherwise, then the protection from the ewes wears off and then they don't they haven't produced their own protection just yet. So, yes, you, you do need to vaccinate the lambs as well. Right, well, um, with that then, I will thank Kat again um, and thank you all for joining us. Um, I hope you have a good rest of your day um, and hopefully you'll join another of our webinars at some point soon. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.